Check, check, check.
three. Testing.
All right, it's nine o'clock on the dot. Please stand up to your feet, friends. I greet you this morning in the name of the Lord. The Lord be with you. This gorgeous day, this is the day the Lord has made. So therefore, let us rejoice and be glad in it. Well, good morning and welcome. My name is Andrew Forrest. I'm the senior pastor here at Asbury Church. We're glad to have you joining us for another Sunday that God has given us. Here, we believe that every single day we get is a gift from God, and every face we get to see is a privilege. So with that in mind, therefore, why don't you turn to 200 of your closest friends and just say, good morning. I'm glad to see you. Shake a few hands this morning. All right, friends, you may be seated this morning. You may be seated. We're going to begin our services a little bit different this morning. We have uh, some of our children who are going to be leading us and opening us and calling us to worship in our children's choir over here this morning. And, and as we're preparing our hearts for worship, and as I'm about to begin with a word of prayer, I just want to remind you that all of us were children once. And these little ones will one day be parents and grandparents and great-grandparents, God willing. And that time is so quick. And today, therefore, is so precious. These next breaths we're about to receive are a gift from God, and we're never, ever going to receive them again. These next moments only are going to happen once. And God has good things for us today. So therefore, let's draw a breath and open our hearts as I begin with a word of prayer. Come, thou almighty King. Help us thy name to sing. We come to sing thy praise. Father all glorious, o'er all victorious, come and reign o'er us, thou ancient of days. That's our prayer this morning, Lord. And we pray that you send your Holy Spirit in this place, that you take our songs, our silences, our words, the bread and the wine. Use these things, Lord, for your glory and for our good. We thank you for the gift of the children that will be welcoming us and leading us and calling us to worship now. Lord, we pray that we'd be a singing church, that the hymns of the faith would be part of our heart and part of our story. We're praying for the next generation, Lord, that you would send them to us, that we could teach them your words and to live like you. And we ask all of this now with expectation and perhaps even desperation and with joy. We ask this, Lord, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And all the people agreed with the prayer and said, amen. Let's worship. We're glad that you're here today. Thank you. 
Well, thank you so much, boys and girls, for leading us this morning. And aren't you thankful for our children's music ministry, just like Pastor Andrew was saying? What a great opportunity that we have to pour into their lives at such an early uh, age to plant the seed of God's Word through music that will carry them through life. So thank you again for leading us this morning. We have gathered together, friends, to worship the Lord our God, to give Him praise and glory for who He is and all He has done. So won't you stand with us as we sing this great hymn of the faith, To God Be the Glory, Great Things He Has Done. Let's sing together. To God be the glory, great things He has done. So loved He the world that He gave us His Son. He led His life and us home and for sin. And though men the light gave that all they know in. Praise the Lord. to give thanks for this morning because of who Jesus is, because of what he has done. And so we're gonna continue to worship this morning through this great song called My Tribute. And as we sing the verse, I just want you to call to mind some of the things that you have to be thankful for. We're gonna continue to sing this morning. How can I say thanks for all the things you have done for me being so undeserved yet you give 
to prove your love for me. A voice says of a million angels could not express my gratitude. All that I am and ever hope to be. I owe it all to thee. Sing it with us. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. For the things he has done with his love. You know, I love the church calendar and the way we celebrate things, starting, you know, with Christmas, and then we go to Easter, which we still have the lilies here. They'll be up until the end of May, and then we celebrate Pentecost on May 28th. We're going to have one service that day at 10 a.m., and I'll explain why here in a minute. But what I love about the church calendar is it, it progresses us through the life of Christ and the celebration of what He did for us. And the song we sing in modern worship a lot, King of Kings, it starts out like this in one of the verses. It says, and the morning that you rose, all of heaven held its breath till that stone was moved for good. For the lamb had conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who'd come to the Father are restored. And hear this line. And the church of Christ was born then the Spirit lit the flame. Pentecost is when we celebrate when the church of Christ was born. What better way to celebrate something like that than a party? Like I said a minute ago, we're gonna have one service at 10 a.m. That, that's not the party, although we're gonna have a great service. The party is after the service, and you'll know it's a party that day. There's gonna be decorations, red velvet cake donuts, and out in the west parking lot, we're gonna have food trucks for after the service. There's gonna be inflatables for the kids and the adults. It's gonna be a good morning, I'm telling you. If you typically park right out here in front in the west parking lot, you're gonna need to park somewhere else. If you utilize some of the handicap spaces, we're gonna have some parking set aside for you by the, the playground over here, and we will have golf carts running back and forth all morning long to make sure that you have easy access. Like I said, it's going to be an incredible morning. We're also encouraging you to wear Hawaiian shirts that day, even to worship. Now, I will say, Pastor Graham last week wore a Hawaiian shirt to tell you about that, but Pastor Graham is way cooler than I am. And so what I've done is I've, I've got a picture of myself in a Hawaiian shirt for you guys. Yeah. <laughs> so. 
The code is a little deceiving, isn't it? (laughs) It's going to be a great day. May 28th, one service at 10 a.m. We hope that you will be there. Also, if you are able, we want to encourage you to park a little further out that day. Because we want to pack the house that morning, we want to make it accessible for those who aren't already worshiping with us. We want some new faces to be a part of us that day. And so let's be hospitable and leave some of the closer parking for them. And speaking of those that are new, this next part of the service, we have no expectations of you. As we move into our time of giving, if you are new here, we don't expect you to give. In fact, we've got a gift for you when you leave this place. Also want to remind you, don't forget to check in with QR code at the, in the pews next to you. But as we come to this time of giving, the, those of us that are regular attenders here, we know that we give out of what God has already given us, out of that abundance. And we'd like to say this verse together as we prepare our hearts and minds for that. Will you join me? All things come from you, O Lord, And of your own have we given you. As the hosts come forward, let us receive our morning tithes and offerings.
Let's pray. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth and your amazing love for us that you don't count our sins against us but pour out your love on us through the gift of your son. Every good and perfect gift comes from you, O oh Lord, including the gifts that we receive daily and the gifts that we have just given back to you. We ask that you expand them, multiply them, bless them, Lord. Light flames here to carry your light out into the darkness. This is our prayer today in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. This oldie goldie picture is of the Ohio Wesleyan baseball team, 1904 to 1905. Now you can see the players and their hairs are parted a certain way and they're wearing those baggy, old timey baseball uniforms. And if you look closely, you'll see there are two men that don't look exactly like the others. The one is the manager on the left, is a good Methodist boy. His name was Wesley Ricky. He was the manager of the 1904-1905 season. In the middle is another young man who looks a little differently than the others, not because he's not wearing a uniform. He was one of the ball players, but because of the color of his skin, he's the only black man on the team. His name was Charles Thomas. And the schedule that year called for them to play Notre Dame in South Bend. So the team traveled and checked into their hotel the night before the game, and the clerk told Mr. Charles Thomas, the young black man, that he was not welcome in the hotel because of the color of his skin. Wesley Rickey, the manager, prevailed upon the hotel to allow Mr. Thomas to have a room. But later that evening, when he went to check on his players, he found Mr. Thomas pulling at his hands and just distraught and despairing and upset and humiliated and angry and hating the color of his skin and saying, this is the problem. That's one of your ball players there. What do you do when you're the manager? If you are the young ball player, what do you do? What do you do? It, it's easy to think that talking about emotions is just the emotions that are inappropriate. The, the, the online meme, first world problems, just to get over it. it. Took you a little bit longer to get to church. You sat in an extra red light, something like that. But what, what about the emotions that are provoked by the actual brokenness of the world? And what about the emotions that are provoked in you because of your love for the people that are around you? What about when they're emotional, when they're overcome, when they're afraid, when they're anxious, etc.? What do you do? We're going to wrap up our emotion series this morning by looking to Jesus. Because contrary to what you might think about him if you don't read through the Gospels, he is actually an emotional person. And yet he doesn't allow himself to be controlled by his emotions. He has something else always larger in mind, I think this is the way forward for us as well. Let's talk about it. Well, good morning and welcome. My name is Andrew Forrest. I'm the senior pastor here at Asbury Church. I'm glad to have you joining us this morning as we wrap up, as I said, this three-part sermon series on emotions. The basic premise for the series is this. You can grow up and have white hair and have a million kids and grandkids and great-grandkids and have been retired and all the marks of adulthood and maturity and still be living like a child in the grip of your tantruming emotions. And this is not the way of Jesus. The way of Jesus is to maturity, to grow up, to realize that rather than being controlled by your emotions, to control your emotions in the way of Jesus. So that's what we've been talking about through this series. And this series rests on top of our current church-wide reading plan through the Psalms. Asbury is a Bible reading church, and we're reading one psalm a day all through the summer. So you can pick up one of your psalms journals out in the, in the lobby on your way out. They are free. Make sure you grab your bookmark. And today, church, is what psalm number? Psalm 21, which means tomorrow will be Psalm 22. Tomorrow will be Psalm 22. And so here's my advice to you if you've already 21 psalms behind. Cut your losses. 
Jump in tomorrow. They don't build narratively in the same way, so we'd love to have you join us tomorrow morning with Psalm 22. It's a great one. You don't want to miss it. But if you're here today, you're not a Bible reader, maybe you're not even a believer, I'm really glad you're here. I want to say to you that whatever your week has been like or your life's been like, whatever you look like, whether you believe what we believe or even if you vehemently disagree, in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, you're welcome in this place this morning. With that in mind, therefore, let's take a breath. Attend to this moment that God has for us as we open our hearts and minds as I begin with the word of prayer. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. So cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. To that end, O oh Lord, I pray that you take my words and speak through them now. Take our thoughts and think through them. Give us insight. And then, God, I pray that you take our hearts and fill them with love for you and for your world. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. I'm pleased to have uh, one of my brothers and his family visiting us this morning from out of town, their first time to Tulsa ever in their lives and the first time here at Asbury. And they brought with them my little niece who was eight months old. And she, I think she's in childcare right now. So far, so good. We'll keep our fingers crossed. And she's a little baby who's inquisitive and wants to see everybody else's face. And in fact, all little children are meant to mirror the emotions of the people around them. And so when you smile at a baby or a baby smiles at you, you can't help but smile back. And you make, you stick your tongue out and you kind of act silly in front of a baby. There's a mirroring that happens. And there are videos online you can watch that will break your heart from studies in which adults were instructed to keep a still face in the view of an infant. No reaction, no emotion, no emotional mirroring. And the children, the little babies, become almost distraught with terror and fear and alienation after just a few seconds. Because we were meant for those sorts of connections to mirror the emotions of the people around us. Now, this is just a study that talks about what infants need, thanks be to God. But of course, in reality, there are many children that are never actually given that sort of love or attention or emotions. And, and it's like something breaks in your mind or in your heart. You actually need that. See, we are emotional creatures. We are meant to mirror the emotions around us, which is why the whole topic of emotions is so difficult. Because you can decide that you will be in control of your emotions. But what happens when everybody around you is behaving like they're out of their mind? What happens when everybody around you is in the group of fear or anxiety or something like that? Well, here's a, a documentary. It's called Airplane. It came out in 1980. This scene may be instructive. Check it out. I can't stand it anymore. I've got to get out of here. I've got to get out of here. Calm oh, down. Get a hold of yourself. Oh, Julius, please, let me handle this. I've got to get out of here. Calm down. Now, get back to your seat. I'll take care of this. Calm down. Calm down. Get a hold of yourself. Don't do your one on the phone. Everything's going to be all right. Please. Sister, please, please. now handle this. I've got to get out of here. It's so tempting though, right? It's so tempting. When somebody is having an emotional reaction, uh, emotional uh, uh, tantrum around you, it's very tempting either to be pulled down into it or to react in an equal and opposite way. They are angry, then you get angry at their anger, etc. And so the danger is that, well, the danger is that we are constantly driven by the emotional winds that are blowing around us. Never true ourselves, never moving forward ourselves. We're going to look this morning at a very strange incident in the Gospel of uh, Mark, in the life of Jesus, Mark chapter 1, that I think shows us a very important lesson from the life of Jesus when it comes to managing emotions. It starts in verse 32, chapter 1. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. I've noticed recently, maybe they've been there for a while, but I've noticed recently at some of the big intersections right around here by church, the city of Tulsa has put up signs that instruct you in the appropriate way to deal with panhandlers, which is not to give them money for your car window. 
And virtually every day now, you'll see somebody at one of the intersections gesticulating, looking around, matted hair, filthy clothes, often walking in lanes of traffic, talking or screaming. Someone who's in a deep, 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 dark hole. And you just, you know that those people need help. But you also know that the help they need is such a, an exhausting type that one person probably can't help them. It's not a simple solution. And I know just enough about folks who are in those sort of places to know that it's both really exhausting to try to help them and unbelievably discouraging. Now in the Bible, in the Bible, Jesus has often encountered, encounters those sorts of people. And sometimes in the Bible, the scriptures talk about po- folks under demonic influence. Now for modern people, the talk about the demon, uh, the demons and the spiritual world is, is very often unsettling or troubling. We're gonna work through all those issues this fall as we walk through the Gospel of Matthew. What I just wanna tell you today is that in the New Testament world, there is no problem with the idea that humans can be under malign or malevolent influences and that God has power over those things. And so people bring all around the house where Jesus is staying in Capernaum, folks in need, physical need, mental need, etc. cetera. There's this little note that Mark tells us, verse 33. The whole city was gathered together at the door. If, if I had, outside my door, just a horde of people, sick, sick in their mind, sick in their spirit, clamoring out, asking for mercy, it would, it would really trouble me. I wouldn't like it. I'd feel overwhelmed, I'd feel afraid, I'd probably feel frustrated, I'd probably feel angry. And here's Jesus, and he's got all this around him. Now, sometimes it seems as if in the Hollywood versions of Jesus that he is he's like Mr. Spock, totally unemotional, only cares about logic and physics, or he's like a Jedi and just says, these aren't the droids you're looking for, and he goes about his business. This is not the picture of Jesus in the Gospels. He's actually really emotional. When Lazarus dies, for example, he's overcome with grief, and then he's angry at the sight of death, Lazarus in the tomb. When he approaches Jerusalem and enters the city the last week of his life and he sees the money changers there taking advantage of the poor people, he goes in, he flips over the tables and he makes a whip and drives out the money lenders from the sacred precincts of the temple. On the last night of his life, he's grieved, he's really lonely. He wants the disciples to watch with him while he's praying in the garden and they fall asleep and that hurts him. And then of course there's the terror as he makes his way to the cross. He's an emotional guy. And so you you could understand it if with this whole horde of people around him, Jesus decides not to engage. You might think that the way, well, the way to overcome your emotions and not be overcome by them is to just not put yourself in situations that are gonna provoke emotions in you. That's not what Jesus does. Look, verse 34. He healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. It's this beautiful picture of Jesus just right in the place that would be the hardest emotionally to be. I mean, I don't know how many people lived on earth when Jesus lived on earth, but obviously it was hundreds and hundreds of millions. What percentage of them were sick or afflicted or oppressed? I mean, the work would be never ending, be super discouraging, and nevertheless, Jesus enters into it. So the right answer can't be for us to somehow detach from the world, just protect yourself. The problem, though, is how hard it is, well, how hard it is to not allow the true problems of the world to provoke emotions in you that then run wild like wildfire and can't be controlled. It's really hard to be with people at hard places. It's really hard to live in a dangerous world and not times feel fear or to see the hatred and outrages in the world and not find them being provoked in you. 
Two weeks ago, I talked about Cain and his example of how when he's overcome by emotions, he murders his brother. And I think it's not that hard for us to reflect on our own lives and find the times when we have ruined a relationship or a moment because we allowed ourselves to be overcome with anger. We gave ourselves into it. It felt good. Almost you feel righteous. Like you're the judge. They need to pay. You need to show them. You need to say it. And that's a major danger for us. But I am... I am becoming increasingly convinced that maybe the real danger with being controlled by your emotions is not so much what you do by what you don't do. It's not so much about what you focus on, but what that focus means you're not focusing on. What if the moment you are overcome by emotions, distracted by them, is the moment that evil wants for you to be. Okay, so I have a video here. It's gonna test your powers of observation. Your job is to count how many times the players in white t-shirts pass the basketball. Focus, here we go, watch the video. This is a test of selective attention. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. So we have them moving around, back and forth. Sometimes the pass in the air, sometimes it's a bounce pass. You have three players in white and three players in black, and they're moving around like some sort of magician or a sleight of hand uh, artist at a carnival. Keep your eyes focused, count the passes, add them up, count your fingers, add them on your toes. It's gonna be a lot, but don't lose focus all the way through How the end of the video. How many passes did you count? The, the correct, correct answer, answer is, 15. is 15 passes. 15 passes. But did you see the gorilla? In the middle of the video, there's some poor guy wearing a gorilla suit. He beats his chest and walks on out. Now, it's a silly little example, but the implication is profound. And it's this. When you focus on one thing, it means you're not focused on something else. When your attention is grabbed by one thing, your attention is not grabbed by something else. And I'm wondering if we're all being played. See, we like to argue over the media and tell people that they shouldn't watch that channel, they should watch this channel. You know what? Uh, I don't watch MSNBC, I watch Fox News. I don't watch Fox News, I watch MSNBC. I don't watch either, I watch CNN. Nobody watches CNN, that was a joke. And so we're arguing about, <laughs> we're, arguing about <laughs> we're arguing about what shows you watch and, and, uh, and what media you consume and who you subscribe to. It's not that the information doesn't matter, but I wonder if the real problem is that we're all being outraged in equal and opposite ways over the same thing. What are we missing? Could it be the case? But that's exactly where malign, malevolent forces, the forces of evil, to use New Testament language, want us to be. We're all arguing over the same square feet, so to speak. We're all talking about the same thing, yes or no, black or white, hot or cold. Meanwhile, we're missing what's all around us. I'm convinced that maybe the major problem with us these days and being controlled by our emotions is that we are missing our larger purpose and what God has for us. The very next thing that happens the very next thing that happens, Mark 1:34, Jesus heals their diseases, casts out their demons. The very next verse is Mark 1:35, one of my favorite verses in the scripture. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. The very next thing that happens after a night with the hordes of people pushing around him and all the misery and all the brokenness and all the, the, the filth and the smells and just the pain, he literally removes himself, withdraws, and he sits in the silence, and he's quiet. I was talking with my wife over just this topic of emotions and Jesus and she made the, the, the really uh, important point that, yes, Jesus argues with people and, and he, he'll answer questions and, and you see him doing that. But he doesn't spend all his time arguing with people. In fact, it's almost like he does it when it can't be avoided or he has to make a larger point. 
And Jesus, he heals a lot of people. But he also leaves a lot of people unhealed. He does a lot of teaching. Surely there's a lot of topics he didn't address. Because what you see with Jesus is that he never allows emotions to distract him from his larger mission. Never. He feels the emotions. They're there. But then he moves his eyes back the direction to which he was called. So we have had some unwelcome guests at our house the past week. I'm not talking about my brother and his family. <laughs> I'm talking about little furry winged mammals, bats. Y'all didn't tell us. <laughs> so we noticed them last week. They're in the eaves and you can see them just in the edge where the brick meets the wood of the roof line. So we've called, we've signed the contract, we've paid the money and They'll be taken care of this week. But for some reason, last night and this morning, I was really worried about it. Like, what are they doing to the house? What, what's the problem? How quickly can the guys come out and get rid of them? Will there be damage we have to address? I've already done everything I can do. I've already made the call. I've already paid the money. I've already made the decision. There's literally nothing that I can do right now. But I've just been worried about it. It's, <laughs> it's almost as if there's like a spiritual force that doesn't want me to think about what I ought to be thinking about this morning, which is what I'm doing right now. It's almost as if that if I allowed myself to be controlled by emotions, that I can't do anything about at this point. I have allowed the emotion to provoke the action in me and then that's done. It's almost as if that uh, I am being tempted to keep right in that place of anxiety or worry or fear and thereby miss well, this. With just respect, can I ask you? You look back over the years of your life, whether it's been many or a few, is it possible that you allowed yourself to be controlled by emotions such that you missed the larger mission that God had for you? I like what happens next. 35, rising early in the morning while it was still dark, he departed and went to a desolate place and there he prayed. One of my favorite verses. Verse 36. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. They found him and they said, everyone's looking for you. Folks need stuff from you. They, they need you to feel their pain and to show their emotions and to honor them. Everybody's looking for you. Where have you been? He said, let's go on to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that's why I came. And he went out throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. It's so interesting to me how Jesus is always moving toward the end. Our emotions are a gift from God. And we are made to mirror emotions and the emotional tenor and note that's around us. It's a good thing to be emotional. Jesus is emotional. But like all of our gifts, we have to give our gifts back over to God. Because in our own hands, without the instruction of the wisdom of the Lord, from the time of the Garden of Eden to the present, even the good gifts of God, we can twist and pervert and, and ruin and miss. And our emotions are like that. They're, they're meant to tell us something about the world. But the thing they're meant to tell us is about, well, about the larger mission. And, and I just wonder if those mornings by mornings in the quiet and the dark, if what Jesus reflected on as he received the love from the Father that the Father delights to pour out on the Son and the power of the Spirit was the emotions that Jesus felt of the anger and the fear, and the despair of the people around him. And I wonder if it provoked him toward his mission which he never lost sight of. So here, here's that oldie goalie baseball picture. I love the old uniforms and the haircuts. And it's so hard to realize these were real people like us. You know, the sepia tone of the photograph makes you think that somehow they're not real. They're real like us. 
And the man on the left had a good Methodist name. I mean, after all, the mascot of the Ohio Wesleyan University baseball team was the Battling Bishops. And the good Methodist name of the young man who was the manager for the 04 05 season was Mr. Wesley Rickey. Everybody called him Branch. And he grew up and he was a ball player and then a coach and a manager and then an executive. In the late 40s, Branch Rickey decided that he was going to do something about, well, the racism that was codified unofficially and officially in America for all those decades. And he recruited this man, Mr. Jackie Robinson, to be the first black player to break the so-called color barrier in the major leagues. And he made, well, an almost impossible offer to Jackie Robinson, did Branch Rickey. Branch Rickey said, you're going to be the first black player to break it into the major leagues. And you absolutely have the talent to do it. And he went on to win Rookie of the Year, I mean, the Hall of Fame, an unbelievably talented player was Jackie Robinson. But Branch Rickey's deal was, and you can't ever, you can't ever, you can't ever respond. One of the the things that Jackie Robinson faced, one time somebody released a black cat on the field and said, hey, it's your brother. One of the managers wanted to rub his head and say, hey, you're like a shoe shine boy. You bring me good luck. People said stuff to him spit on them. And the deal was, when they spit on you, you can't spit back. And when they curse at you, you can't curse back. And the pitcher tries to take your head off, you can't charge the mound. And some people say, Jackie Robinson died as a young man in his early 50s, that it was that hatred that killed him. But he never lost sight of the larger mission, which was to integrate Major League Baseball. And I know that he felt emotions. In fact, in the Negro Leagues, he was a hot-tempered player, they say. He, wouldn't, he didn't like it when somebody pitched too close to him or crowded the bag. He was a hot-tempered guy. But in the major leagues, he held on to it. Of course he felt hatred. Of course he felt shame and anger and terror and fear. Of course he did. But he didn't allow the emotions to control him. Of course, Jesus felt anger at the way we treat each other and the way we blaspheme against God. Of course, he felt sorrow in his heart when he saw the lepers and the outcasts. Of course, he was provoked righteously at the idolatry and the greed and the violence of Rome. Of course, he felt terror on the way to the cross. But he always kept the cross in mind because that was always his mission to go to the cross and die and thereby reconcile the world back to the Father. And he did it. I'm convinced that one of our problems is that we allow emotions to distract ourselves from the larger purpose that God has for us, from the mission. And I'm going to tell you this morning what your mission is. Your mission is just to receive the life of God more and more from it every day. That's your mission. Your mission is not necessarily to accomplish anything in the world. I mean, Jesus is the one who's going to fix it all ultimately. Your mission is just to experience and to receive more of the life of God. And the life of God, the the life of the Father pours out on the Son, and the Son loves the Father when the strength of the Spirit is a life of joy and peace and excitement and peace, gentleness, creativity. That's your mission. And it might be that God has a few things for you to accomplish on the way, a few X's to cross out and O's to circle and I's to dot and T's to cross, maybe. But I'm telling you, the mission that God has for you is just to receive the life that Jesus died and rose again to give you. If you're here this morning and you're not a believer, you're not sure where you are, you may have an entirely wrong idea about the Christian faith. This is the essence of the Christian faith, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. The mission is just to receive life. All you have to do now is just say, yes, Lord, pour out your life on me. That's what it means to be a Christian. And it begins and it never stops. And and I'm just so convinced that unless we learn to give our emotions over to God, we will constantly be like tantruming children controlled by them and thereby miss what God has for us right even now. 
Every breath is a gift from God and they're not gonna be here forever. But as long as you're breathing, God's not done with you yet, which means your purpose still remains to receive more of the life of God, even right now. So don't, don't think somehow you can withdraw yourself from the world, you can't. And don't, don't try to not feel the fear that comes from being human or the anger, but allow them maybe to provoke you in mission, to drive you back to prayer. And maybe most importantly, let us follow the way of Jesus, the one who went first, and open ourselves up every morning to hear the voice of God. Because here's what's amazing. Like babies, we're all meant to reflect the emotional life of the people around us. So you could decide, and this is what hell is like, I think, ultimately, to reflect the life of miserable people disconnected from God all around you. Or you could decide that early in the morning, while it's still dark, you're going to withdraw to a solitary place and there pray. And then your face begins to mirror the life of God, a smiling, joyful, burning love for the world. And that's who you'll be in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, every single Sunday we retell ourselves the story of what's ultimately true and the summary of the faith. We begin by saying the ancient words, the summary of the faith taught by the apostles, and we call it the Apostles' Creed. Let's begin by saying these words together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to the dead. Let's stand up. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Don't allow emotions to distract you from the life that God has for you, the life of becoming more like Jesus. In fact, Christ our Lord invites to his table this morning all who love him and seek to grow into his likeness. That's your mission. So let us draw near with faith, make a humble confession, and prepare to receive this holy sacrament. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own goodness, but in your unfailing mercies. We're not worthy that you should receive us, but give your word and we shall be healed through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, this is the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and that proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Therefore, lift up your heart to give thanks to the Lord our God. Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, you made us in your image to love and to be loved. When our love failed and we turned away, your love remained steadfast. By the suffering, death, and resurrection of your only son, Jesus Christ, you delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread, blessed it, broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks to you, Heavenly Father, gave it to his disciples, and said, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So, Lord, this morning, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. So by your spirit, Lord, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and then one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Lord, through your son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. And therefore, with the confidence of the children of God, Let's pray the words that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The hosts will direct you forward here shortly, and you'll come forward with your hands like this, should you want to receive. We'll give you a wafer, we'll give you a cup, you can eat and drink. I'd encourage you to pray at the rail before you make your way back. Maybe something like, Lord, help me to control the emotions that you have given me, not to be controlled by them. Help me to hear your voice first and make me more like you, something like that. You don't have to be a member of our church to receive Holy Communion today. It's for all baptized Christians, regardless of what church you come from or background. Speaking of baptism, I'm I'm about to leave right now before the end of the service. I'm baptizing six confirmation students this morning in the chapel right now at 1015, and we'll have our big confirmation service this evening. If you're interested in baptism or wondering more about coming into the faith, we have a baptism service coming up on the 14th of May. We'd love to talk to you about that. And if you're here this morning not sure what you believe, maybe you just sit still and and pray, Lord, 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 speak to me. Give me life in your name. But no matter who you are and where you're coming from this morning, friends, the table is prepared. Please come as you feel led.
As you're able, we want to invite you to join us on this great song. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Let's sing together. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel His mighty power and His grace. I can hear the brush of angels sing. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence. The Lord is in this place. In the midst of his children, the Lord said he would be. It doesn't take very many, it can be just two or three. And I feel that same sweet spirit that I felt of times before. Surely I can say that I've been with the Lord. For surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel His mighty power and His grace. around us as God's glory fills this place I've touched the hem of his garment I can almost see his face and my heart is overflowing with the fullness of his joy I know without a doubt that I've been with the Lord for surely the presence of the Lord is in this place I can feel His mighty power and His grace I can hear the brunt of angels sing I see glory on His face Stand as we sing that again. Surely the presence. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel His mighty power and His grace. I can hear the brush of angels sing. I see glory on His face. the first verse of this hymn. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to me.
What a wonderful morning of worship. Will you join with me? All of our problems, we send to the cross of Christ. All of our difficulties, we send to the cross of Christ. And all the devil's works, we send to the cross of Christ. And all of our hopes, we set on the risen Christ. Now, I know we're really a coffee-drinking church. There's coffee all over the building. But it is my pleasure this morning to tell you we have some freshly brewed coffee at a station out here. It's wonderful coffee, and you need to try it. And we want to just thank the volunteers that have worked hard to make this happen. So if you... (laughs) Well, you received this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. Go now in peace. See you next week.
what it is. Uh, I know. I have this little. There's a belt. And yeah, okay. Kayla is coming back to me, and then we can run my Jesus. Got a pocket? Yeah, stick it in your pocket. Jesus. Christ. What do you mean this baby? No, because in my shoe. Yeah. This is like I'm a piece of tape. I have to stick it on me when I wear it. Hey you hey guys. Problem solved. Get it, Lindy. Get it. Slide to the left. Slide to the right. Everybody mop the floor. You do it so slowly.
hear it again in about 20 minutes. <laughs> Sing along, now you know it. Sing along, you know it now. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm good. I'm gonna go get those kids. Thank you so much. I appreciate you so much. I'll be back. Awesome. I'm gonna put this away. Guys, we're going to come back at 10 minutes till. So.